I think a leader, uh, number one, is someone who can lay out a vision uh, and really give a group of people clarity about what needs to be done. Welcome to the Access to Innovators podcast, powered by the Premier Life Skills University, High Point University. Good morning, my name is Wendell Epps. I'm a senior at High Point University, majoring in sports media from Fairfax, Virginia. And today I am joined by the wonderful Sip Marshall, who is Dallas Mavericks CEO and also High Point University's sports executive in residence. Sint, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thanks for having me. It's so good to see you. So great to see you as well. I know we had the chance to interact a little bit yesterday at the Dallas Mavericks Charlotte Hornets game, and that was definitely a fun game. Would have loved for the Mavericks to win, of course. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> a great game, nevertheless. So yes. uh, today, just want to pick your brain about the industry, your journey, and awesome. just how you got to where you are today. So okay. uh, the first question I'm going to ask you is going to be, this is going to sound like a simple question, but it's probably going to be one of the more difficult questions you get asked. And okay. I want to know, who is Sint Marshall? Okay, Sint Marshall is a mother of four. Uh, I say that first because that is the most important aspect of my life. Uh, so I'm the mother of four, the wife of one for almost 40 years. Um, I am um, a person that's about service. Uh, I am a servant leader. Uh, I am passionate about children and education and permanence and stability uh, for children. I am a woman of faith. I am a hard worker, uh, definitely type A, um, and I love community service. I am a huge advocate for education, and I just think that every child deserves a great education, whatever that looks like. Uh, so I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate. I'm a champion. Um, I'm a sports person. All of that. I'm every woman. You're everything. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's so great to hear. And, you know, obviously now today you are known as, as one of those top leaders within the sports executive industry. And I'd yes. love to know um, specifically about going back in the past about your first full-time job search. Do you remember what that process was like and what were some things that you did to get that first job of yours within sports? Well, actually, my first full-time job search was when I was in college uh, on campus and trying to figure out what I was going to do after college. And then I had uh, 13 job offers, so I had to uh, make a decision about what type of work I wanted to do. And I just knew I wanted to lead people uh, because I am about being a, a servant leader. I just wanted to serve uh, people even at 21 uh, years old. So I had just some basic criteria uh, that I wanted, and, and one of those was about serving people. Um, and so the job search, uh, it just went great because I wasn't focused on any particular uh, industry. Um, and so uh, my first job in sports, of course, came to me because that's when I got a call from uh, Mark Cuban uh, about uh, the CEO position at the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, so I wasn't searching uh, for it. Uh, but my first search, uh, I think I was pretty broad in terms of the kind of work I was willing to do. So it worked out for me. That's great. And I know obviously getting the call from Mark Cuban about the Dallas Mavericks job had to just be absolutely just amazing feeling. Uh, can you talk to me about that, that that process and just what that was like? Well, it was amazing because I didn't know him. Okay, so, so that's what my husband had to tell me actually uh, who he was. And I actually think that says a lot about him is that he wasn't calling some friend to come out and help him or somebody he knew. Uh, he had heard about my reputation in terms of culture transformation, uh, leading people. I had worked for AT&T for 36 years and led our effort to get us on Fortune's best place to work list. Uh, so he heard about all that and then uh, called me. And I had to really think about if I wanted to come out of retirement. I had worked for 36 years, been retired uh, for about 10 months, and actually had started my own consulting business. And it was going Great. And so I had to really think about, OK, do I want to uh, do this? I didn't know anything about the business of basketball. I was a big, you know, a big sports fan, basketball fan, all that. But I didn't know anything about the business of basketball. And he told me I didn't need to know what I needed. to. What he needed was a leader. And he would teach me and other people would teach me about the business of basketball. And over the last five years, that's what's been happening. It's been great. There's a business to all of this. I mean, there's a whole industry that I really didn't know about. 
Uh, so I'm blessed to work with some fabulous people uh, who know the industry. And now I know it obviously much better than I did five years ago. It's always fascinating talking to leaders like yourself. You keep mentioning how like those leadership skills you were able to develop during your time with AT&T transferred well with the Dallas Mavericks. I'd love to know in your perspective, more of a two part question here, but where did you get those leadership qualities of yours? And for High Point University students listening to this podcast, what do you think makes a great leader in general? Okay, I love that. I love that question. I love talking about leadership. Uh, I cultivated my leadership skills as a child. And honestly, it goes back to uh, my mom getting me involved in activities, uh, doing things at church, uh, having to stand up and uh, speak at church, having to organize uh, activities in the community and at school and all that. Uh, so really, I can point back to my childhood and Think about just the organization and planning skills, the visionary skills uh, that I developed, just the art of uh, laying out a vision for people and leading people, rolling up my sleeves too, and knowing how to be a good follower because a good leader is a good follower uh, as well. Uh, so, and then of course, you know, just over my journey uh, working in different jobs and all that, I had 15 different jobs at AT and T, and so just built on those leadership skills uh, throughout. Uh, but they start very, very early. So just don't underestimate the skills you are developing uh, here on campus when you're leading activities, leading clubs, being involved uh, in different uh, organizations. Those skills really do help you lay a good foundation uh, for being a leader. I think a leader, uh, number one, is someone who can lay out a vision uh, and really give a group of people clarity about what needs to be done. Uh, a good leader uh, leads by a set of values and people know what they, they are, and uh, they're uncompromising. And, and I have some of those, such as character and respect and authenticity and all that. And I brought those uh, to the Mavs as well in terms of uh, a core set of values. Um, I think uh, a leader is open, open to new ideas, willing to try new things. Uh, just uh, the sky is the limit. And, 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 and you're open to other people's ideas. A good leader does not have the answers. A good leader knows how to tap in uh, to other people. I think a good leader um, does the right thing. Uh, when you talk about character and integrity, that's the main thing. And I often say uh, there's a difference between doing things right and doing the right things. Uh, managers manage. They manage things. They manage uh, uh, activities, get results and all that. Leaders truly lead people. They do the right thing. It's, it's, it's more than just manage. That's so. awesome. And I think leadership is just such an important quality to have. And the fortunate thing about High Point is the opportunity to be able to be a leader within oh. different clubs. And you can yes. do it right away, even when you come in as a freshman, have an opportunity to get involved and be active member yes. in your club. And I think that's so vital now, especially in today's society, especially for those that want to work in sports, to get that leadership in college now, yes. whether it's being president of the Sport Management Association or National Sports Media Association, and exactly. getting that opportunity to lead here that'll prepare them for the real world as well. Absolutely. And an opportunity to try new things and to actually make mistakes. Uh, because, of course, leader makes, leaders make mistakes, but leaders learn from their mistakes. And so to be open to feedback uh, from other people. And leaders also have to be willing to give the feedback, to deal with the tough issues, to deal with the hard issues. Um, I have a leadership philosophy, and so it's three L's. I believe that in order to be a truly effective leader for me, I have to do three things listen to the people, learn from the people, and love the people. And truly love them as people. A person who gets up out of bed in the morning, the issues they have, the dreams they have, the beliefs they have, all of that. That's who I welcome into my workplace. That's who I welcome on the screen if we're working virtually. Not somebody who's just going to go to a phone booth and put a big M on their chest for Mavs and come in as somebody else, some superhero. I want that person who gets up out of bed in the morning. I want to love that person, the dreams they have. Uh, so as a leader, I can help them uh, accomplish those dreams and accomplish the things they want uh, in life. And of course, you have to listen to people and listen from the standpoint of tr really trying to understand what they're saying and what they're not saying. And then learn, uh, learn about them, learn about the job they're doing. Every job I've had, I've walked in and said, okay, I don't know a whole lot about this. And in some jobs, I don't know anything about it. Uh, so help me learn this job. And so I'll spend time with people. When I was at AT&T, I actually went to pole climbing school. I didn't have to, uh, 
Uh, I was probably three or four levels above the people who climbed the poles, but I wanted to learn about what these people do every day so I could actually serve them. So listen to the people, learn from the people, love the people. If I do that well, I'll be an effective leader. Most definitely. And with the Dallas Mavericks and leading them as a CEO, what did you find to be the most challenging thing when you first started the role in terms of being a leader there? Because obviously it's an NBA organization, high reputation, great history. What was the differences of leading an organization like that? Oh, yeah. Learning the business of basketball. Now, I didn't have to know it, but I'm one of these kind of people. I, I kind of like to know the subject matter. And as a leader, you're not always going to know the subject matter. And in, in, in fact, the higher you go, often you don't know the subject matter because people will call you just like Mark called me uh, to lead different types of things. Because what they're looking, looking for is somebody who can provide a vision somebody who can lay out a set of values, somebody who can lay out a plan, uh, someone who can staff the organization, who can identify talent, who can build relationships, uh, help with, you know, build a business plan and all that. So they're looking for all of that that has nothing to do with the actual product uh, itself. So the hardest thing for me was doing all of that and not knowing the business of basketball. But they taught it to me. Exactly. And I still don't know, of course, what, all of the folks know who've been around, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, but I know enough to be dangerous. And working in the NBA right now, you're very active in the sports management industry. You know what's going on. Yes. I'd love to know right now, what do you think is the biggest trend at this moment today? What do you think is the biggest trend in the sports industry? Oh, I think uh, sports betting is big. Uh, just looking at what's going on around the country and different uh, states, uh, uh, passing legislation. We have not done that in Texas uh, yet, uh, but really uh, sports betting is is big. It has it has changed the game. I was actually sitting uh, next to someone at a game recently, and they were actually rooting for our team, but they were not. They didn't have on our jersey. They had an opposing jersey, and the guy didn't know who I was. And he finally looked at me, and he says, oh, gosh, I got, a, I got, I, I got I, my, my spread, my spread. And I'm thinking, what is he talking about? And then I realized, oh, my goodness, he's got something going on around sports betting. And so it has changed the game. I think it has uh, engaged uh, more people, but uh, a lot to come, I think, around that. Uh, I think our, 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 our industry has really become global. Our league has become very, very global. We've branched out into the Basketball uh, Africa League. And so we have so many international players. In fact, I think our team is one of the most uh, international. And so looking at it from a global standpoint uh, is big for us. And then, of course, uh, media rights and what's going on with just how uh, consumers are, uh, how our fans are consuming our content. And so they, they're, they're consuming it in a very diff different way, not your typical Let's watch the game on uh, TV, but streaming and all that. So um, we got a few different trends that are going on uh, that are impacting our business. And frankly, they're very exciting. We got to figure it all out and we got to, frankly, help shape it. Uh, so it's kind of exciting. It's an exciting time to be in this industry. That's awesome to hear. And now I'd love to kind of shift gears to more about job searching, interviewing and making a name in the industry, because obviously a lot of college students that are trying to work in sports are really trying to break in in any field. Yes. Um, it takes time to break in. So I'd love to know from your perspective, uh, just watching new employees come in the door every couple months or so with the Mavericks um, and in your time working in general, uh, what are some of those qualities of those new employees that really impress you? Okay, I love that. I am so impressed to win. First of all, just uh, in the interview, when they know my team, they know my team, they know the industry, they know what's been going on with us. It shows that they have prepared and they've really done their homework. And so I like that. I'm always impressed by it because then sometime I'll stop and think, how do you know that? And then, of course, they know it because they've actually stopped to do their research. Uh, they're just not coming in trying to pull something out of me. They've actually invested the time um, and so I love it when they come in with ideas, too, because they've been following something we're doing or they know something is going on in the industry that they think uh, we should jump on top of it. I love it when they come in uh, with ideas. Uh, I watch collaboration and teamwork uh, very closely uh, because we're a team. I mean, we are all about teamwork. You can't win by yourself. 
And so I like it when they come in and they want to get involved in uh, activities. We have employee resource groups and just all kind of activities, community service uh, projects. I love it when they come in and they want to get involved. And when they are interacting with other people, uh, they are spending time, you know, together, even outside of work. I, I like all of that because they're showing that they want to come in and be a part of uh, something bigger than just uh, themselves. And so, and I, and I love it when they come in and roll up the sleeves and work on their pieces, but then also they will go around to see how they can help uh, other people. Uh, and not just from the standpoint of teaming or collaborating, but really trying to understand the bigger picture. Uh, I love people who come in and say, yes, I'm in this job, uh, but I want to learn about the industry. I want to learn what goes on. I don't know it all. And so they're not walking in with any kind of career plan. Yeah, ultimately, maybe they want to be the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, right? But they're not walking in saying, I know exactly what I want to do. They're open to learn. So I like it. I, I, I like to see continuous uh, learners really kind of just come in and just figure out what else they're going to put uh, in their tool belt. So I watch all of that. Collaboration, the teamwork, uh, integrity, obviously, uh, is important. So that always jumps out if if somebody comes in and they're not telling the truth or something, that's a problem. <laughs> Fortun fortunately, that does not happen often at all. Uh, we have some very wonderful people uh, walking in our doors. I love that you talked about the whole interviewing and, and researching and candidates knowing because I feel like a lot of times we see these job postings and we're like, oh, how cool would it be to work for the Dallas Mavericks? And we forget that, wait a minute, we got an interview to get our way in. We're not just going to get the job handed to us. So. Exactly. And, and you want to dig in. You want to dig in to see, like, is it really that cool to work for that company? Uh, what kinds of things are going on there? I mean, so you, you, you want to, you know, research it and they're all kind of, you know, activities and uh, I mean, uh, publications, et cetera, out there, uh, all kind of ways to find out about organizations. Okay. So you, you, you can Google, you can read the headlines, you can go to uh, Glassdoor. I mean, there are all kind of ways to do that. Right. And so you want to find out and you want to find out what kind of values are in a place. I had an employee tell me a, a few years ago, he said, Sin, it never dawned on me that I should ask an employer, what are your values? He said, obviously our values matter a lot. And we have our values at the Mavs are character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety, both physical and emotional safety. So they spell crafts. Everything we do is about crafts and our employees love it. And he told me one time, he said, it never dawned on me when I was in college and interviewing to ask an employer about their values. I said, well, when I was your age, it never dawned on me either. I mean, just something I never thought about. But of course you realize that you want to be in a place where your values align with the company's values because if they don't there's a mismatch and so you, the way you find out about a company's values it's actually dig in and research and see what's going on there and then talk to employees uh who work there so you got to dig in it's, it's exciting sometimes you see these job postings and you say oh i want to do that okay well you might want to do that but do you want to do it there find that out first and then you go for it I always joke with people, especially those that work in sports, that that's kind of like our free agency with the whole job search. You yes, know? yes. <laughs> Trying to find the right team that's going to be a good fit, you know, with right. the values. Because it has to be a good fit. It really, and sometimes when it doesn't work out, like nobody should feel bad. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Uh, but you have a greater likelihood of it working out if you do your homework. It's just like employers do a background check on you. I mean, don't think you just show up because you did a great job in the interview. You you got hired because you did a great job in the interview. You have something the employer wants. You have, you know, some background or at least uh, the desire to do something, but you also passed a background check. I know for us, we do a background check as well. So you also have to do a background check on the company. Most definitely. And I'd love to get your opinion on what are your thoughts right now of this whole job search and interview thing kind of moving digitally now. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you can find online now about companies. Uh, they're looking at your social media. It's so much technology. You can connect with people on LinkedIn and reach out to them that can start off as an informational interview and then maybe a couple months later leads to an internship or job opportunity. I'd love to get from your perspective, what do you think are just some pros and cons about that digital shift now within the job searching industry? Well, I think the upside is it makes it easier to, to and quicker. Uh, to access information. I don't really form a lot of judgments uh, in terms of making a final decision. I have to see the person. 
I have to see the person. I've got to be able to interact with them. I have to have that human connection, uh, even if it's on the screen. Obviously, I prefer to do it uh, kind of face-to-face. Sometimes that's not possible, but I'm not going to hire anyone just based on a background search in terms of just their social media and all that. Now, I will tell you, I have four, I have four kids, okay, and, and they're older now. So, But when they were younger, I'd, I'd always tell them, be careful what you're putting out there because people will judge you based on that, right or wrong. Be careful. What you don't want to do is miss out on an opportunity because somebody actually misjudged you based on something that you put out there. Uh, So I give my kids these tips even when they start to work, when they get out of college. And one of the tips is always make sure that what you're putting out there actually reflects who you are because you have no idea who's looking at it. So I think it's okay. I think the digital thing is fine. But I have to have that human touch before I'd actually hire you. Definitely. And you were obviously part of Amazing History being a female getting into the NBA as a CEO, but also being a minority. So your story is inspiring to to both circles, to females aspiring to work in sports as well as minorities trying to work in sports. And I'd love to know from your perspective, um, how much have you thought about that? The the fact that you've actually been able to inspire a, a large amount of people that are aspiring to hopefully get in your shoes one day. Well, I will tell you, I hadn't thought about the fact that I am the first black female CEO in the NBA. I had not thought about that. I didn't know that was the case until an actual journalist mentioned it in a national interview and asked me how I felt about it. And I said, I can't be. And at that time, it was 2019. I said, I just can't be. Well, well, I decided at that time is I won't be the last then. Yes, maybe I'm the first. I won't be the last, and I have to do a great job. I have to do a great job so there would be no doubt that somebody who looks like me can do this job uh, at an exceptional level, and then it will make people want more people who look like me. Uh, So it's not pressure or anything. It's just that I want to do a great job so that people will know they're on their limits. And I want people who do look like me to know they can do it. They can do it. Um, I, uh, I get letters and uh, social media messages and text messages, emails all the time uh, about uh, inspiring people. And every time I get one, it's just very touching to me. And, and I just thank God uh, that he put me in a position to uh, inspire people uh, because it's it's a beautiful thing. I, I don't do it on purpose. I'm just doing my job uh, and just honestly trying to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And if it inspires somebody, that is Beautiful. I'd rather inspire people (laughs) than discourage them or give them a bad uh, feeling because I think we're all put on this earth. Uh, I wrote a book recently called You've Been Chosen. I think we've been chosen to do some very special things and everybody has a unique role to play. And mine seems to be lifting up people and connecting people and inspiring people. And so that's my role. And so I just pray every day that I live it out in a way that's pleasing to God. You mentioned your book, You've Been Chosen. Yes. Uh, I'd love to know what was the inspiration of writing the book? And you sort of talked about in that last answer yeah. sort of your values and messages you were conveying in the book. But I'd love to know what was the inspiration? And for those that do end up having the chance to read it, what do you hope they get out of it? Yeah, the book really uh, came from my cancer battle uh, in 2011. And apparently throughout that, my cancer journal, I just wanted to publish the journal. People ask for it. They've been asking for it for years. I get calls all the time because I chronicled my 12 rounds of chemo. And so someone said, we should turn this into a book. And so for all these years, 10 years, I didn't. And so finally, uh, we took my rounds of chemo and then we, the, <laughs> the writers added a lot of other stuff to it. And if I had to summarize it, it's a book about how God and great people always show up in my life and how we've been chosen for adversity and chosen for the good things. So the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly. That Nothing happens by accident. And so I was chosen for the chemo class of 2011, and there were a lot of people chosen to show up. Uh, They were chosen to show up in my life to help me through that, and that's what life is all about. We've all been chosen. uh, We've been chosen for things that happen, even the adversity, but we're also, also uniquely equipped to handle the things that show up. And so I'm supposed to be here for you and you're supposed to be here for me. My theme song in life is ain't no mountain high enough. And that's because of the words really say there's no mountain too high to keep me from getting to you. 
And that's what it's all about. And so that's what the book is about. Bad things do happen uh, to good people, uh, but accept adversity and just never give up. Uh, sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is a train. I mean, bad things do happen, uh, but together uh, we can get through it. So with the help of God and great people, you'll get up. You'll, you'll get knocked down, but you'll get right back up. That's what the book is about. That's amazing. And ain't no mountain high enough. That is the song. Oh, that's my song. That <laughs> is can, my song. I, I can echo that. That's awesome. <laughs> that's my uh, song. Yeah. So the last question I have for you, Sint, and okay. thank you again for your time today. Uh, oh, thank I'd love, you. I'd love to just know, obviously, life skills is so big here at yes. High Point University. No one has a premier life skills university. Um, and I think one of the big things that we're taught freshman year in Dr. Cobain's present seminar is standing out and being unique uh, yes. within the industry. So in your opinion, what advice would you give to students like myself and others um, in terms of how to stand out within this industry, how to be unique, how obviously in an industry, especially like sports, so competitive, so many people fighting for that same job. How do you stand out? How do you be the one that can stand out and make an impression on employers? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's about standing up first. So know, know who you are, know who you are, know what you're about, know what you will stand up for and what you will stand for because people really pay attention to that, uh, just who you are as a person. And so integrity really does matter. And you know when you are talking uh, to someone with character, and especially when you've done your homework and all that. So, so that is honestly the first thing. And you are unique. There is something very special that you'll bring to the party. Know what it is before you show up to the party because it's your job to let me know what that special thing is. It shouldn't take me six months to figure it out. When Wendell walks in, I should know after talking to you for 15 minutes what you're going to bring special to the party because you're going to tell me. So know what it is. Know what it is and don't be afraid to talk about it. Not in a boastful way, but in a way that says, I'm so happy to be here and I want you happy that I'm here and here's what I am going to bring. When I show up, people know I'm going to bring leadership. They know I am going to bring life to a situation. They know I'm going to bring a vision. They know I'm going to bring a, a plan on how we all work together to accomplish something they've never even thought about because I have a way of laying that out very quickly. Know what your unique role is. Know what your strengths are. Know what that special thing is that you have because we all have something special and unique and make sure you talk about it in just a few minutes when you meet somebody. Amazing. Sid, I can't thank you enough for hopping on the podcast today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. You too. I'm always amazed every time I get to hear you speak. You always have so much insightful stories and advice to share. So well, really I'm so proud of you and it's so good to be back here at High Point. I love this place. It truly is extraordinary. Of course. Thank you. So for Sid Marshall, I've been Wendell Epps. Thank you all for listening.